Welcome, everybody, to the Hustle Culture Podcast. And as always, I have my co-host, Carlos Gill. But today's guest is an absolute favorite of mine. Her name is Kristen Leonard. You're going to hear her story soon. But uh, she's someone I've gotten to know over the past couple of years. And I absolutely love her heart, her mission, and what she's about. But, you know, Carlos is getting to know her. And uh, we hope that she shines your day and brings light to your day as she's done to mine and many many more Los- yo yo what is happening hustlers welcome to another episode of hustle culture we are here broadcasting live on blab so big thank you to those of you that are tuning in with us make sure that you tell a little bird let's get the twitters chirping and for those of you listening on itunes a big thanks for all the reviews and all the subscribers we love you guys we couldn't do this without you and we are really excited to be kicking off today's show with Christian Leonard. She has an amazing story, great background. She's the president of a nonprofit called Shining Scars, which she is going to talk about on today's episode. And she's bringing the shine. And with that, I just want to say welcome to Hustle Culture, Christian. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here. Ah, love it. Now, Kristen, we normally start off the show with uh, our weekly grind. So Carlos and I are going to talk about what we've done during the week and how we we were grinding, and then we'll pass it on to you. But, you know, I want to say- age before beauty, my friend, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> age before beauty, Carlos. You know, I'm, I'm the second youngest on this, on this hey, I'm, interview. I'm the old so. man of the podcast and of the group here today. I'll, I'll take it. And I'm a baby. <laughs> <laughs> How was your week, Carl? You know what? It was it was good. And in true hustle fashion, it was a balancing act, right? Besides having a full-time job, balancing two podcasts now, which have recently gone live on iTunes, one of them being Hustle Culture, which we went live a few weeks ago, and the other being Social 545, which I co-host here every Thursday with, with Saba on Blab. We just hit the iTunes store a couple days ago. So that in itself is, is just a great accomplishment to be able to have two shows running consecutively, not only on Blab, but have those go live on iTunes at the same time. And, you know, for me, uh-huh. it, was, uh, it was actually a monumental week because it marked seven years since I lost my job in the banking industry back in 2008. And, you know, for me to be able to look back on how far I've come in those seven years and all the trials and tribulations and be able to dust myself off today and see him a much in a much better place as a person and as a professional, not only is it a blessing, but it's just a great will and testament to passion, perseverance, and hustle. So, you know, again, man, it was just a great week. Awesome to be able to look back on the past, but see where we're at today in the present and where we're headed in the future. How about you, Tayo? Congrats, Amy. You know, like you, I've been doing two podcasts. So my first podcast is told by Nomads just clocked 100 episodes on Thursday. So we, we, we're celebrating that. I got to do that with my family. And, and uh, you know, it was an interview with mom, uh, you know, my brothers. We got to tell our stories. So that, that was quite the achievement because it was surreal because I, I realized I didn't know I was approaching 100 until I was at 90 something. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I'm actually the 100 episodes. And this started as a, as a little dream. And obviously it led to UID Media and all that. So it, it was great to, to, to get to see that. Um, and then I unashamedly live in the best city in the world, New York City. <laughs> so this week, <laughs> this week I decided to uh, take advantage of that and go meet uh, at least more than five people. I wanted to do something. So I got into uh, a few networking events and I got to meet, really embed myself in a society of like-minded people. And it was great. It was great. It's something I don't get to do a lot because I'm always busy. And sometimes I, I tend to forget right. uh, the world around me. So it, it was great to do that. So, you know, it was the podcast uh, celebration for that and just acknowledging that. And then, you know, again, to spend time with family um, virtually since I'm always right. traveling. But right. and, then, and then the last thing was uh, um, also taking care of myself uh, physically, because one of the things that you do and Kristen knows this and you know this is you travel a lot. And you, sometimes one of the things you can neglect is it's your physical well-being. So I, I made sure I did that. And um, oh, I started my first book of the month. I'm doing something where I read a book a month. So. I just started my first book of the month. It's the recent New York Times bestseller from our mutual friend, Lewis House. Yes, sir. School of Greatness. So I just started that. So um, that was me. What was my weekly grind? Kristen, what about you? What was your week like? My week was pretty busy. I had exams to study for. I go to West Virginia University. I'm a freshman. 
So I was able to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Last weekend, I went to a family day held at our mountain lair. And I was able to sell my children's book there and see all little kids dressed up for Halloween and visit with their families. Um, I also <laughs> have been going through some health issues. And so this week was my first week back into working out and eating healthy and doing that. Introducing myself to the dean of my school and um, being able to be accepted by our president, Gordon Gee, and how much he appreciates what I'm doing for my community and for the school. And just being able to talk to my professors about what I'm doing, about my TED Talks, about doing this interview with you guys today, and how excited they are for me to have a student who is going above and beyond to really make their life successful and to hopefully um, give WVU a better name. Love it. Love it. Love it. I mean, obviously, you do a great job, you community, and that gives us a great segue, right, to the first question, Carlos. You want to take that? Yeah, you know, tell our listeners here on Hustle Culture and those that are watching here on Blab, tell us a little bit about you and your background. So you're young, you're in college, but you also have a great story of how mm -hmm. you got to where you're at today with starting your company or your organization, which is Shining Scars. So tell us a little bit about the, the background behind that. Well, my journey started out as being bullied as a young child because of physical scars that I had. I had surgeries growing up, and so with that, being able to have stitches or bruising and different things like that, the kids saw me sort of like Frankenstein, and so they would call me different names and stuff. And after a while, I was being beaten down by my bullies. I sort of accepted what they were telling me, and then Miss West Virginia came to my school one day. And she told us that we could be anything that we wanted to be. And I felt like she was looking right at me and that that gave me hope for one time in my life, for once in my life, that I really could go out and I could change. I could change their perspective or their opinion of me. And I can do this. I want to be Miss West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so that seemed to be a like, big joke in my school and around my peers. But then as I got older, you know, I decided to overcome my bullies. I overcame the stigmas of my scars. I overcame the stigma of what beauty and perfection is in today's society. And I really understood that it is so important to believe in yourself and to know that you are perfectly imperfect just the way you are, that everything that is so beautiful about you, it shines from within. And so because of that, I decided to compete in pageantry. And when I started competing in pageantry, you had to have a platform. And so I wanted my platform to be about my scars. And so Shining Scars was created when I was 15. Um, from there, I was able to write my own children's book, Shining Scars. I got published when I was 16 years old. Wow. <laughs> I met so many incredible people. I was introduced to David Mezapel in New York. And because of that, he was able to introduce me to people so I could do my first TED Talk. I was able to co-author a book with him. I was able to do a Contagious Optimism live talk. I was able to go to the Next Gen Summit this past summer. I was able to meet Teo. I was able to meet all these amazing people. And that's where my journey started, just from one little dream of a little wow. girl. And, and Christian, yeah. how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I know, I know it's not polite to ask a lady her age. No, no, that's the weight question. You're not allowed, allowed <laughs> to ask me how much I weigh. <laughs> 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 I just turned 19 this September. Wow. So 19 years old, yeah. you're, spe you're doing TED Talks. You are a published author. Just amazing. So you talked about your scars and just the impact that that's made on you as a person. If you don't mind opening up, tell us a little bit about those scars. Why do you have them? Okay. Uh, when I was about five years old, I was diagnosed with a lipoma growth on my leg. It was on my left thigh. What it is, is like a fatty tissue pocket, and it was maybe the size of a 50 cent piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day I had an accident at my daycare center the day before Thanksgiving. I got kicked in the face with a milk crate and it split my mouth. And so I had to go to the hospital to get stitches. And there, that's where I met my doctor who did the rest of my surgery. She was the nicest man. And uh, he said, I know exactly what that is and we need to remove it so it doesn't stunt your growth. And so I went in for surgery and I ended up <laughs> being much larger than what they thought. It had grown around into my muscle and wrapped itself around my bone and my leg. So it resulted in a nine inch scar. And when I went back to school trying to heal with it, the students thought it would be hilarious to like try to see how many times they could hit me until my stitches could bleed. Mm -hmm. um, they, I would try to wear jeans to protect my legs so like I wouldn't bump into like a desk or something like that. Uh, they also wanted, because it took me so long to walk up the stairs because it was so hard and it kind of hurt in your skin to pull, uh, they would push me down the stairs mm -hmm. over and over until 
something would happen. Wow. And then I would just go, I would just stay on the first floor and just go to the bathroom and cry to myself. But um, just some more bad news. I just, I just hated it so much. I hated that that's how I was being treated because I was different. And so they said, well, we can do revision surgery. We can try to make it smaller. And I said, yes, absolutely, please do that. And when I went in for that surgery, right. they didn't put me under, they didn't put me to sleep. So I was awake during the procedure, but we found out that my body was allergic to local anesthetics. And so I could still feel everything throughout the entire surgery. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And that was, Ugh. that was my worst nightmare ever. And I realized that if I have another scar, I'm just going to leave it. I'm never going to try to change it. It doesn't matter what they say. <laughs> it was just too painful. And then in, that was whenever I had just turned seven. And then I had surgery again when I was in the fifth grade because I had a birthmark on my back that was starting to change into melanoma cancer. And uh, that was very hard for me to understand because I was only in fifth grade. I, mm -hmm. The only sun exposure I got was in the summer when I was swimming and most people get skin cancer from laying in tanning beds and things like that. And it was really hard for me to know that I had to get the surgery done about a week before school let out because it would take me two months to heal. And I remember after that surgery, I slept on my floor on my stomach for two months. I couldn't sit in a chair. I couldn't sit on my couch. I had to sit on the floor. Couldn't hardly brush my teeth. Um, I couldn't run. I couldn't swim. I couldn't do any of the things that the other kids were being able to do in the summertime. And it was just very sad for me. And those are my scars. And I have little bumps and bruises in between here and there because I'm very clumsy. And my doctor has also called me twinkle toes because he had to stitch up one of my toes one time. And um, I fall a lot and I've even fallen up the stairs countless times. But, you know, it's just who I am as a person. And now I've been able to love my scars. I love the story behind them. Even though some people see it as sad, well, now I'm turning it, it, turning it into something positive and so that no other child has to go through what I went through with their physical scars. Absolutely. And love it. You know, Kristen, when, when I first met you, it, it, was, um, it was online, obviously, but it was through our mutual friend. And I just watched your TED Talk, which we'll link later on. I know someone's asking. And I was I was impacted by the way you turned bullying into an, you know into something that you embraced right you you turn, you take you took that difference of, that you had and then you made that something that you loved and you know that I, I run a media platform which says uses difference to make a difference and I really wanted to tell your story and when I started doing I've done two interviews with you I started to see how compelling natural and just honest you are with your story you didn't hold back anything can you talk about how that bullying has built your character and that how you've really grown to embrace the fact that you're different, how you've really grown to embrace your scars and why you feel like that message is so important for people out there, kids and adults and entrepreneurs and hustlers. I really feel like there's way too much pressure on children and teens right now mm -hmm. to be perfect, to be Barbie, to have the however many Instagram likes you can get or how many followers you will have. Um, I think there's way too much pressure on them to feel beautiful and to say one year you have to have, you have to be so skinny that you have to have a thigh gap. And then the next year, no, you have to have all these curves or dyeing your hair with ombres or shaving your head or doing this or doing that. And just really just put it, pull, pushing your body through things that aren't natural. And I think that a lot of children think that that's the only way that they're going to be able to stand out. That's the only way they're going to be popular. That's the only way they're going to have so many friends whenever all those likes and all those followers, half of them are empty. And it's just really sad because they don't know who you are as a person. They don't know how great you can perfectly be. And children who are impacted by bullying need to find their inner star. So I feel like my nonprofit right. is there for those children to understand who they are as a person and that they, that they can be something great just as long as they believe in their dream. I mean, whenever I was in sixth or seventh grade, way after I said I wanted to be Miss West Virginia and all the students laughed at me, if you would have said that I would have competed yeah. in pageants, I would have laughed at you and said, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in your dream, buddy. Um, just because I wasn't confident in who I was. And it, I remember one year growing up, I, told, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, I'm going to lie to myself one time every day in the mirror. My very first lie that I ever told myself was that I was pretty. And then the next day I said I liked my hair. And the next day I said, I liked my outfit. Or the next day I said, I'm going to get an A on this test. And I repeated that for 365 days until I finally started believing it. And then I finally started seeing who I was as a person. And it wasn't what those bullies had told me. 
and I truly mm. did find my inner star. I found who I was. I found my purpose. I found how many people that I can encourage, how many people I want to be there for so they never have to experience the pain that comes with bullying and physical scars and emotional scars that last a lifetime. Yep. And I yeah. really want... No, and, you know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. And I, I just feel like I can really be a voice for the social change about the stigmas of beauty and perfection. Um, children who are faced with physical challenges and terminal illnesses need to feel empowered and encouraged. They need to feel that they are just important and they can do as many things or even more possibilities than those students who live everyday lives. And I feel like we need to ha teach those children to love themselves from the inside out. Because I know how hard it is to try to love yourself from looking on the outside in, and it is horrible. It's terrible. It's not an easy job. And so I think that once we show them who they are as a person, then I think that this society is going to change as a whole. Absolutely. And, you know, you talked about bullies right now, and there's so many bullies today in the um, virtual world. They're called trolls. <laughs> Now, your, <laughs> your story is, is so interesting because you were bullied, you were made to believe you were not beautiful, and then you flipped the script, and then you became a beauty pageant, which is the complete opposite. You know, you, you, were, you were competing at this, and, and I imagine as you competed in this, I don't know if you had a moment where you would talk to yourself like, wait a minute, I'm actually here. These are people that are considered beautiful by, by the rest of America, and I'm here. Did you ever have a moment where you were thinking um, it, it conflicted with your message, or do you ever have people coming and tell you, why are you saying this and doing that? Because I, I know you as a person personally, and I know how true you are, but I also know how cruel people can be and lack of understanding that they can do it. Do they think, oh, what are you doing? This is not your message. <laughs> and if you have that, how do you deal with that? Uh, how do I deal with it? Uh, usually whenever people come up to me, they, I, they haven't heard my story yet. Whenever they come up to me and say, why are you wearing a crown? And yet you say you have scars, but yet you don't show them and you don't do this. It doesn't really add up to me. What, why is this someone else's story that you're telling? And I'm like, no, it is my story. And I share with them my story and how, you know, even when I was doing my TED talk afterwards, this girl came up to me. She said, I don't really believe you. She said, I don't believe your talk, what you said. She said, because right now you're standing in front of me and you're wearing makeup and hair and crown and you're all dressed up. She's like, but if you say that's not who you really are, but you're trying to send this message out to be perfectly imperfect, and then why are you wearing makeup on stage? And I try to explain to her, I want to put my best foot forward. I want to make a difference. I want people to remember me. And if that's me being um, as close as presentable as I can <laughs> and to be professional mm -hmm. and to treat this as my job, as my future, then I am going to put on makeup and I'm going to do my hair <laughs> and um, just put my right. best foot forward, share my message in a way that I know that people will respond better to. Christian, right. Christian, let's talk about a little bit about the impact that social media has made on on this generation today, especially kids. So I know I grew up in the 90s. I'm a little bit older than, than you and Tayo. And back then, we didn't have Instagram. We didn't have Snapchat, Facebook. But personally, I'm going to just share a very personal story. You know, I was bullied growing up as a kid because I was overweight. And I felt this, uh, you know, I had this complex. And even to this day as an adult, it's like this complex, always being aware of like how I look, you know, do I have like you know, the right clothes? Does my hair look good? Like all this, it doesn't really change because right. like to your point, you're scarred mentally as a kid and it, it stays with you growing up as an adult. And I'm you know, very prideful. I have no problem admitting it. And then you know, I was also bullied as a kid because I moved around a lot and I lived in states like Montana and Utah where I was like the only Spanish kid. So I was called Mexican and all these derogatory names. So I think of today in this generation where there is things like Instagram and Snapchat, what role does that play with bullying and what advice do you have for kids or even adults that have kids or have been bullied? Again, Tyo mentioned the trolls. What advice do you have for them? Um, as it pertains to social, right? If you're being bullied on social media or over, over social media, someone's like literally coming at you, shouting you out, saying these terrible things to you, that's just because they're scared of you. They're using their computer screen, they're using their phone not to confront you face to face, just because they know that someone who will be standing right next to you will stand up for you or you will stand up for yourself. And that's, that's what they don't want. They just want everyone to see how big and powerful they can be 
even though they're hiding behind this little screen and nobody else knows about it unless those who follow them. And they just want to feel more right. powerful. So they feel like if they, they're running their own little world in this one media account, and that's not true. That's not real world. They still have to do chores. They still are going to have to work hard in school just like everyone else. And they're, they're just people who are hurt inside themselves. And so you just mm -hmm. have to realize and understand that you should just block, block all the negativity out of your life. Go through all your followers. Go through all the people that you're following, um, all the things that are trending now and stuff like that. See if it's something that you want to happen every day in your life, if you want to see it daily or if you don't want to see it daily. If someone is being right. unencouraging and they just start going there on Twitter just like vent and vent and vent and vent and vent and it's just nothing but negativity the entire time, then maybe that's not something that you want to see on your newsfeed because that might, make, might start to influence how you're feeling about your day. So just go through and then just block out all the negatives, block out all the haters, and just live your life positive, positively as you can. And just follow all those positive media accounts, all those dreaming media accounts, just to help you, um, encourage you to do better and to push more and so that you can be more successful in life. Yeah, nobody has time right. for haters. No one, no one has time for trolls. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? <laughs> yes, nobody got time for that. <laughs> but I love what Jed says here. He says, when you see bullying happen on social media, don't be silent. Yeah. Hashtag don't be silent. Speak out and tell people that that's not cool. And, and I, I think it's I think it's so true. I know you do the rise above and, and you, you talk about a lot of these during your, your speeches. The, I want to know about the time when you realized what you did was making an impact. Because you talked about getting published at 16. You had a TEDx talk. You've had all these things. But how did you see that something you said made an impact which message really touched your heart and, and said wow this is something that's going to keep me going i'm going to keep this also and i'm going to continue to share this message well i when i started out i had hit um a lot of bumps in the road uh one was i wasn't being taken seriously because of my age i was too young i was only 15 years old i was told that i Hello. was <laughs> i was told that i wasn't allowed to be the president of my own nonprofit that i created because I wasn't 18. And so I had to wait and sit back and take another um, position on my board. Uh, I also remember my community just are learning about me and learning about my nonprofit. And the pivotal moment for me was when I attended uh, the Book Expo America in New York City after I got published on 16. And I met David Mezapel, who opened the door for public speaking and who opened the door for me to co-author another book. And that was a really pivotal moment for me because people who were listening to my TED Talk, people who were listening in the audience, they were understanding my message. And they came up to me and told me how different my message was from any other message and that they could really go home and share with their kids about that message that they heard, that they can somehow have an insight to what their children may be going through right now with bullying as any, as, at a young age. No, love it, love it, love it. And and I guess with uh, as you were going through the climb and you 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 told you were too young, you told you couldn't do this. What? How did you push through? Because one of the things we cover with the with guests and the hustle culture is we like to cover that climb, that journey, that nays the naysayers, and the way that we circumnavigate that and use our influence to just um say, you know what, you put this barrier in front of me, but I'm going to find a way to do it regardless because I, I believe in myself and I believe in my message. I honestly think it's the little girl who's still inside me who wanted someone to stand up for her, who needed someone to look up to, and she's with me every day. Um, even though I still suffer with my emotional scars, I know that she's there looking up to me right now. And I want to be there for another little girl who's looking for someone to look up to, whether it's a big sister impact or whether it's just a friend or even a loving, compassionate person that they can confide in. And that's what keeps me pushing forward are those children that I meet in the children's hospital who are looking for someone to share their stories because they can't. And that's, that's the only reason why I carry on. I'm not in this to have followers. I'm not in this for money. Um, I'm in this just to get my story out there so that others can have confidence and to share their stories and to see the reality of what physical scars are and what emotional scars are and how they impact people's lives daily and for the rest of their lives. Wow, that that is powerful. Uh, for our audience love here it. on Blab, please show some props, give some love up to Christian because <laughs> she is amazing. You know, prop bomb. Yeah, give her a prop bomb, please. So a couple Oh my god. 
a couple things I want to call out before we before we keep rolling on with our next question. One, right now we are on the homepage of Blab. So thank you to everyone that's coming in watching Hustle Culture live with our great guest, Christian Leonard. If you guys have a question for Christian, make sure that you go ahead and drop that in the comments section. She would love to go ahead and answer that for you. And also, please tell a little bird. Let's go ahead and, and share this blab out on Twitter. So, Christian, you wrote a children's book. And I, I heard you talk about it in your TED Talk. And you wrote a, a children's book. Tell us a little bit about that experience. And tell us about the book as well. Okay. Well, if I tell you the story about how I wrote my book, I highly doubt that you'll believe me. Um, my mother always told, tells me to exaggerate a little when I tell the story just because that would make it a little bit more believable. But after I had won my first pageant title, I got a meeting with a coach or whatever, and she actually became like my life coach. She's my mentor now, and she helps me through everything. And But at first, she was just like, you can do whatever you want with this platform. She's like, you can write a book. You can do this. You can do that. And everything just soaked like a sponge. I got so excited. I went home that day, and in my math notebook, which wasn't many math homework problems or anything like that, it's not my cup of tea, um, in 15 <laughs> minutes, I wrote my children's book, Shining Scars. And I went to the living room, and I showed my family. And I was like, look, this is my children's book, and I'm going to get it published. And they're just like, OK. Um, <laughs> How are you going to do that? Like, I don't know yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> and they're like, so what's it about? <laughs> I said, well, it's about a little star. And I go on to tell about my little story. And um, my dad's best friend was there watching football with him. He's like, you don't have a name for your character. And I was like, oh, then I'll name him after you. And his name is Eugene. And so nice. little Eugene is a little star, okay. a little star. And mm. uh, he, <laughs> he accidentally, he doesn't listen to his mother. So he flies across the sky, he fast and falls on the moon, and he gets a crack, but then she takes him to the hospital, and they do tell him, you know, you will have a scar, and it's right there on his face, so he's all freaking out, and he's nervous about what his friends are going to think. Are they going to treat him any different? Are they going to ask him a million questions? And he's trying to avoid the whole situation, and his mom tells him, you know what, don't worry about it. She said, they're going to love you the way you are, and he wakes up the next morning, and his scar shines brighter than the rest of his body, and then he's not scared anymore, because it's absolutely amazing, and he cannot wait to show his friends. And so he goes in the very last page, which is my favorite page, he taught about how it glowed and he taught about how it shined and all his little friends said, look at mine. So they were all hiding scars from each other and they all came together and they were all able to share their fantastic stories about how they got their scars. And to me, that was just very, that was a very important ending because I wanted everyone to see that everyone does have a scar, whether they hide it or whether they don't, everyone has a story behind it. And as a little kid, it's kind of exciting to hear where those scars come from. I know when I make my children's visits, I let the kids guess where I got my scar from. So at one point, I was on Mars fighting aliens. Um, the next moment, I got eaten by a shark. Um, that was awesome. I was, also in, I was also in a rock and roll band, and I was climbing trees one day, and I fell. Um, so just to hear their imagination and just to under, for them to really think that my scars are cool, just so that they can have that memory so later on, if they meet someone with a scar, they won't um, treat them differently than how they are. They'll ask them, hey, what's that story behind there? without actually being like, so why do you have that? And it's just like the way you say it and the way you present yourself and the way you fully accept people who are different than you. Christian, that is real talk. So you are a published author, you're a speaker, you're the president of your nonprofit, you're also a student, and you're 19 years old. You have such an amazing future ahead of you. So tell us a little bit about the impact that you feel that you've made on someone else's life. Give us, you know, if you have an, an example of someone that you feel that you made an impact on their life, give us an example of that. And also tell us a, about how everything that you've done in a short period of time, how that has impacted your career and your life to this point. Um, I can, <laughs> I can definitely say I've been able to impact several people in my community just because I am a small town girl. I care about community, about my community. I care about um, all the students and all the people who are having difficulties and in the different clubs um, and church events. I know for a fact that there's this one little girl named Erin Turner, Erin, Erin Turner. I'm so sorry. And um, I met her on one of my first hospital visits, and she had to have heart surgery, and so her scar was right there. And I got to show her my scar, even though mine was healed and hers was not. I got to talking to her a little bit, and she was a preteen then. 
And here she ended up being from my hometown and she went from, went to a school that was 20 minutes away from mine. And so that was really cool to see her and become family friends with her and talk to her and basically become her big sister and just give her advice whenever she needed and really change her perspective on herself because she was devastated about her scars. She always has been. She will wear t-shirts up to here. All of her homecoming dresses or prom dresses are up to here. And it's really my life purpose to get her to understand that your scars are beautiful, that they share a beautiful story about how strong you are and what kind of person you are. And then once you fully accept that, everyone else is going to accept how great and amazing and perfect and all this beautiful and everything that you are. She's athletic, she's smart, she loves to play, she's artistic. And I want people to know that side of her. I don't want people just to look at a scar and see her as a sad little person because she's not anymore. And so I try right. to mentor right. her now. And um, since I am in college, it's a little more, more difficult to get up with her every now. But, um, but uh, you know, I'm still keeping in touch with her, and she's always keeping in touch with me, texting me all the time, giving me calls. Um, she calls me her big sister, and she always ends with the call saying that she loves me. And so I feel like I've really been able to impact her life and her sister's life and those around her. Um, and it's a very humbling thing for me. I get emotional sometimes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just really want to be there for more kids. I want to be a mentor for several students, whether they're boys or girls. Um, this journey that I've been on has impacted my life in a tremendous way. I can't even, I can't explain how humbling it is just to have a dream one day and then just to have a little bit of luck, a little bit of faith, um, yeah. just to keep on going, keep on pushing. I was told no so many times when I first wanted to have this nonprofit, my mother told me no. My parents said, no, you're not going to do this. It's too hard. It's not worth it. Why would you want to do something mm -hmm. like that? And I'm saying it is going to be worth it. It will be worth it. This is something that's so personal to me. It's something I can really connect with, something I can really, really be passionate about and want to do for the rest of my life. And it is. And I've been able to prove that time and time again. And because of you guys and all of your support and your friendship and reaching out to me, wanting me to be on here today, you guys are the reasons why my life is so impacted because it's been filled with nothing but positive people this entire journey. And I'm so grateful for that and all the friends that I've made. And it's impacted the way I see myself, the way I see um, my society, my college, my everyday life, my personal and professional, I, it just changed, it changes everything for the better. And I would do it all over again if I could. Love it. Now, speaking of surrounding yourself with positive people that make an impact, who are three people that are the most impactful in your life? Three people who are the most impactful in my life. I would have to say um, my board members who I just had a meeting with this morning. They have been there from the start. They've always helped me, pushed me. Um, encouraged me, whether they were family friends at first or, you know, my mental coach, they were always there and they were always telling me just to keep going, going, keep on going. If someone out there is going to say yes, someone will be able to share this, share your story and it'll blow up and be something amazing. <laughs> and right now, to me, whenever <laughs> I just got my book signed, that was something blowing up into being amazing. I was not expecting that at all. Um, of course, my younger self, who I keep with daily, I keep pushing on because of her, whatever I come across a mountain, I tell myself how hard it could be to climb up and how easy it could be just to turn away. But then that little girl inside me, she says, you don't need to climb the mountain, just push through it. And so then I do that on a daily basis. I push through and I push through and I push through just for the other little kids who are looking up to me, the other future children of this world who may not even be here yet. But if your children are able to grow up in a society where damaged is okay and <laughs> not being perfect and being flawed is absolutely beautiful, then their children are going to understand more about who they are as a person on the inside. Um, also, the children uh, in the children's hospitals that I meet, every time I go there, I'm just truly inspired by their stories, by their love, by their compassion. You know, sometimes I'm just in there just to be a friend and to hold their hand because they don't want to talk. Or I'm there for their parents and to confide, for them to confide in someone from the outside and to really know and understand the pain that they're going through. And understanding or even understanding the joyous moments whenever a child is told that she doesn't have terminal cancer anymore and she's been healed. And that is just an uplifting moment. It fills my heart so much. And usually when I go to those hospitals, I, I never want to leave. I want to stay there for hours. I want to read books to these kids. I want to play games with them. I want to learn everything about them. And so I've been able to do that over the years. And also uh, my family, 
our big supporters now. <laughs> now that they truly <laughs> believe in me and they see, now they see how great of an impact it's been on me in my life. They, they want nothing more than to help me continue to be successful in it. No, that's good. It's good. And uh, Carlos, before you, before you go, I just want to ask this question. Mm -hmm. I, I know this has been asked before. We, you go to a lot of events. You have a platform. You meet a lot of people. But I'm curious as to how you, you, you take the best out of these events. Because sometimes when people go to conferences and events where they're speaking or participating, there's a stigma that says, ah, you just collect cards. You don't connect. You don't actually meet people. But you seem to have a purpose to what you do. So I'm, I, I want to know... At the events you go to, what is your mindset behind that, and what do you always hope to achieve to uh, to help advance your cause? I'm sorry, what? Sorry, we were breaking up over there. I was saying at the events at the events that you go to, what is your mindset when you go to these events? How do you seek to connect with people, and how do you make sure that aligns with your purpose? Oh, I keep an open mind. I know whenever I go in there, I'm going to talk to as many people as possible. Um, I'm a very much the people person nowadays. I want to know who they are. I want to know their stories. I want to know what they're doing with their life. Um, and how can I help them? How can I encourage them? So, like, when I went to Next Gen, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's going to be a lot of people up here who are self-made millionaires. There's a lot of brilliant people who have been dropping out of Harvard. Um, I can't really compare to them. But I am able to share my story with them and able to... <laughs> and able to share who I am as a person and how much love I have for the world and what I'm willing to give to the world. And that's really important. Um, whenever you're going to events, really be open-minded. Talk to anyone and everyone. You may never know who you're going to meet. And it could be, you know, David Mezzapel. It could be Tay Roxon. It could be a superstar <laughs> that you didn't even know again. Or, you know, it could just be your lifelong new best friend. And so you never know. Just always go in there with a positive attitude and embrace whatever is coming to you. Well, you know, Christian, uh, when Tayo and I decided to start up Hustle Culture, we really wanted to use this as a platform, as a stage to spotlight amazing entrepreneurs such as yourself. They're doing great things and hopefully provide inspiration to others out there through the guests that we bring on. And right here in the comments, um, someone just wrote, I love this story. This is exactly what I'm looking to do for kids with cancer. So it looks like someone here watching you right now is feeling inspired and hopefully that inspiration helps them get over the hump. So um, this person's asking, did you start out blogging? And what exactly was your first step to get started? I actually didn't start out blogging. Um, I started out after I wrote my children's book. I started out on Facebook. I created my own Facebook page for my nonprofit. And then from that, I created my website. Um, but also I created the Twitter account, the Instagram account, um, Skype, all these different things put together. Um, what was what exactly was my first step to getting started? Oh, uh, just believing in myself. I had a dream, and I knew this is what I wanted to do. I said, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do it. And I begged and begged for weeks until my mom said, fine, you can do it, whatever you want. She's like, just, you just, you're, you're, you're not going to have any help. She's like, it's going to be way too hard. And I took that as a challenge. <laughs> so a challenge was my first start. And I just went, I just ran with it. I just ran with it and ran with it and ran with it. And now I'm here today and I'm so grateful and I'm so glad that you guys are taking things from my message and my stories. And I just hope that you all are encouraged enough to keep on pushing forward because it'll all turn out in the end. Yeah, Christian. So we also have a, another question from the audience right. around hustle. Nice. So we like to know from our guests what hustle means to them. And this question that we have is around is hustle progress or process what is more important so twofold question perhaps you could answer to you what what does hustle mean and when you really think through it which is more important the progress that you make on your journey or the process to get there i don't think the progress is important at all i think um just me working on the project for about four or five <laughs> years now you know I've gone really really far to me but for others compared to others it's not that far at all and but for me it's my entire world it's made my whole world go upside down and I love absolutely everything about it um, I think it's the process how much time you put into it how many um, connections you make how many friendships you make and not just to get something out of them and then just to leave them hanging but to also want to help them to return the favor, to make these connections that are going to last a lifetime with your business or with your nonprofit. Um, you know, that's 
to be a hustler to me would be someone who is very determined, someone who really believes in themselves or really believes in their dreams and knows that even though someone may, may not understand it and they may sort of bash it or they may you know, have nothing but negative things to say about it, that does not mean that it's true because that's what happened to me as a child. I got told I was Frankenstein. I got told I was ugly. Yeah. I got told that I would never be able to be the princess when we played outside. I always had to be the evil villain. And I believed them, and that crushed me as a child. And I will never get those years back. But I turned it into something positive, and I started believing in myself. And I've never been happier with my life than I am right now. I love it. I love it. And you know what your blab is doing? First of all, this is the most popular blab we've ever had. Um, <laughs> Carlos and I, so thanks for that. And then another thing. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's, we got 295 people that have showed up and 59 current people currently on. And one of the things that you're doing, one of the things that I love that your story is doing, which is why I always say I love that you tell your story, is um, we've got a guy here. He said he was born with cancer, has had 27 major surgeries, and he wants a story to help kids and families with kids who have cancer. And you, you've helped show that it's very possible. And, and you know, you got people like you, Q saying, you know, you're, you're, truly, you're truly an inspiration. So I, I think, like you said, you didn't really think, think of it as, as a um, – uh, you, you, you thought of it more of as, as a process. You know, you were doing what you felt what you needed to do. You were sharing your story. And I find with when I when you share your story, you'd be surprised by the amount of people that actually connect with you. When, when I first started UID and you were there during the early days when I was still trying to figure out what the platform was. But I, I was really just covering stories from, from people like yourself who had unique stories that weren't being covered in the world. And I was frustrated with the fact that no one was voicing these out. And then it, it was crazy when your, your article first came out and your, your interview came out, people were saying, wow, yeah. I don't feel like I'm alone. And I think that, yes, yes. And I always, I always love that particular statement. I don't, I, now I know I'm not alone and I have the, the confidence to continue what I'm doing. And I, I feel like that, that goes a long way, whether you're building a business, whether you're spreading the message, whether you're... You just want to do an impact. We, you and I, we, we joke about how we love Tim Tebow, even though I personally don't necessarily think he's a good, good football player. But I love the fact that he, he did, he does what he does regardless, right? You've got people like that who are doing that, you know, whether it's in, in sports and all that. So I, I want you to sort of talk about those individuals, the celebrities that are doing it the right way. Because I know we've had several a conversation about that. And tell me why you love them. Oh, well, the list could go on and on about people who I find inspiring to me. Um, some are a little cliche. <laughs> yeah, who are but they? as It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> right now, um, <laughs> I knew growing up uh, as a preteen and a teenager that I really looked up to Taylor Swift just because of her role model and always empowering young girls to be who they are. She also empowered um, a platform about reading at one point. And I remember that entire summer I did nothing but read because Taylor Swift said that it was good for my brain. And I believed her. Um, <laughs> What's your favorite Taylor and, Swift? And song, one of if you don't mind me asking. Her favorite, my favorite your song? favorite Taylor Swift song. Favorite Taylor Swift song. Shake it up. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. We don't shake, shake nothing on here. Um, <laughs> my favorite song of hers. Oh, I don't know if I have it. Oh, it'll probably be Romeo and Juliet. Okay. Because I'm a mush bush. I'm a mushy kind of oh, person. I, I don't know. But I, I remember watching her video as a little girl, and she had like the horse and the white gown. And I was like, wow, she really is a princess. Um, Tyo and, so, and I are big Taylor Swift fans, just in full disclosure. Yeah, huge. All right. So you, you got T Swift. T Swift um, doing her thing. All right. Um, uh huh. Uh, I also. And, uh, I'm thinking. Oh, I like Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. Um, I think that she is a big person to stand up for who you are as a person and to not let other people destroy your image just because it may not be something that they like or something that they're used to. Um, I like all of her roles. Well, not I haven't seen all of her movies, but in her role in H The Hunger Games, I think she really stands up for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, and she stands up against the stigmas that she may face and the obstacles and stuff. Um, even being a celebrity and how hard that can be and challenging just to try to separate your personal and professional life and yet 
she's there juggling it all and making it possible. And so I really um, enjoy her message and I enjoy her being a celebrity that says, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be super skinny. I'm trying to be strong. I'm trying to have the best body that I can have for me and to be healthy. So I don't do these crash diets or um, I don't <laughs> just like juice or anything like that. She actually eats real food and she mentioned several times, you know, I'm a real person. <laughs> She said, and I'm going to treat my body like a real person, like the average day person would. Yeah. Um, but like I said, she also puts her best foot forward and she wants to um, improve herself and improve her um, business and how she um, gets different jobs in the TV world. All right. Well, so T Swizzle and, and, and J Law are both great inspirations for women. You're an amazing woman. I, 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 want, I want your opinion on, on ways women can be highlighted more um you know i'm it, it's one of the things that it's always fascinating to me because women comprise more than half of the, of the world's population they have such an influence yet the voices are not as heard as they should be whether it's tech whether it's even you know J jennifer lawrence just wrote a, a nice op-ed on the fact that even in hollywood they're not getting equal pay and just because she's not negotiating that or that and just the stigmas that come with being a woman who's in leadership position you're one who has got an amazing following an amazing influence how do you feel like um, women can get more of a platform and more of a platform? I think it all starts with them believing in themselves. Um, yes, I'm sure there are several women out there who aren't getting equal pay mm -hmm. and they do get hurt about it or they get um, very angry, um, but they don't present themselves in the best way possible. Like if I, if I were to go to a job and I'm not getting paid as much as um, the next person, he's a male, I'm not just going to go up to my boss and start yelling at him and not understanding why <laughs> I'm not getting as much pay for him. I need right. to build myself up. I need to build other women up. Um, you know, women today, we mainly see each other as very competitive. Um, I know growing up in high school, all the girls were always competitive of each other, about how they looked, about how much money they had, things like that. And that lasts up into the adult world. And I think that women are just so focused on tearing each other down that they're not focusing on the only thing that's gonna change is building themselves up, coming together as a whole. And I feel like that is one thing that is going to change, that is going to give them a bigger platform to speak, a bigger voice, is that them coming together under terms that are very, um, you know, well, they're very well known and yet they're appropriate and that they are going to sort of do a um, non-violence <laughs> sort of protest and just to be able to be there for each other, back each other up and just to say, you know, this isn't right. And we're here today, and this needs to stop. Right. You know, so one thing that really stood out, uh, right. Christian, right. early on is you had made it known that in everything that you do, it's not about money. It's not about fame. It's really about your passion. And, you know, oftentimes I say the most successful people in business are the ones that put passion over profit. They're the ones that really pursue their passion. And the money is going to come. The recognition, it's going to come because... That's a byproduct of success. And the success is a byproduct of the hard work that goes into it. So yes. again, at such a young age, you've accomplished a lot. So tell us, where does Christian Leonard go from here? What can we expect to see from you? What can you expect? Well, uh, I still, since I have been signed to IQ, a speaking company, and they're representing me as a speaker now. So I will oh, be wow. making several chips. Both of us. Go ahead. No, no, same. Yeah. Both of us, we're on the yeah. same team. I'm glad to have you yes. aboard. Awesome. IQ. Um, and then, so I'll be making different speaking events and still sharing <laughs> my story. Uh, I am also going to sort of collaborate a sequel to my Shining Stars book. Um, different stories about little Eugene and many adventures that he's going to have. Uh, also, I still am planning on competing in pageantry, so you may watch out and see me on the Miss America stage and the CSA stage. You may never know. Um, and then, you know, just spreading the word around my state, around the nation, even international, how important it is to believe in yourselves and to find your inner star. Uh, also, you know, hopefully I'll be able to get um, even more book deals and being able to co-author even more books, meet more people, go to other conferences and to meet fantastic people there and do more podcasts and do more interviews like this. Like, this is really awesome. I've never done anything like this. And it's been my favorite thing all year. Um, <laughs> That is great to hear. Oh, yes. But, yeah, so just 
And, you know, I, I'm still going to be in college, so I'll still be a student and still working very hard um, to get my grades up and to graduate with my degree and my minor. And so I'm just going to live life to the fullest. I have a feeling. And enjoy everything. I have a feeling that you will be not only Miss America, but you will be Miss Universe. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I have a feeling that she's going to be a voice for yes. women children and people who want to just step into their light and i have a feeling she's going to be able to make that impact um and you know and that's what i said I, you guys are all seeing why she's one of my favorite people in the world i've been saying this consistently i told i told carlos i was like Lose, look she is amazing you don't understand her heart is so much better than than anything you read and then you're starting to see <laughs> you're starting to see why so okay carlos before you, before you ask the, the short time question this is one one thing i want to ask one thing I want to ask here is talk to that person right now who, who is being bullied and who wants to just, just step out of, of their own way, who's like thinking of giving up, and who's thinking they're not enough. Just say something to them. I would say you are beautiful. I see who you are on the inside. I see your pain. I see all the memories that you have. I see all the emotional trauma that you're going through. I know the emptiness that you're feeling, the feeling of no one has any idea what I'm going through. No one will be able to help me because they don't understand. No one has a clue who I want to be. I don't know who I want to be. I don't even think this world was made for me. I don't belong here. I don't like myself. I don't like who I am. Nobody else likes me, so why am I here? And you need to understand that all of those negative emotions just need to go away. And you have the power to push them away. It all comes from inside of you, how strong you are. Who you are as a person determines who you are mentally and in your heart. And remember when I said when I looked in the mirror and told myself 365 lies. You can do that too if, that, if you think that's going to help. Because it helped me. And it helped me realize that you are out there and I want to help you. And I want you to share your story with me. I want you to be able to have a conversation with someone and not be so self-conscious that you're constantly picking at your hands or at your hair. You just stay very quiet and you don't make any friends. I don't want that to be your life. I want your life to be something that's full of happiness and love and compassion. And I want your life to be something that is incredible and that you wouldn't be ashamed to tell your story. I want you to feel so confident within yourself that you're able to look at yourself in the mirror when you wake up and just be okay with what you see or even be happy with what you see. I don't want you to go to bed thinking of all the things that you could have changed, all the things that you think that surgeries are going to change or rumors are going to change. The only change that you need to make is the positive change in yourself. You need to know how much you are loved and how much you can be loved by yourself. And I believe in you. And I believe that you can do whatever your dream is. My dream was laughable when I was 10 years old. And no one believed in me. When I first started out with this whole process, my parents told me no, that I couldn't do it. There was no way, that I was too young and that it was too hard. But I'm here today to tell you that it's not. And because of you and if you believe in yourself, you're able to do so many things with your life and that you will be able to love so many people and help so many others who are going through the exact same thing that you are. And I don't want you to give up. I want you to stay strong and I want you to shine from within. Wow. <laughs> that is, that's some real talk right there. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, I was, I was basically, I'm, I'm I was about to be almost scared. I was tearing up. Awesome. Almost. <laughs> I don't know. What, Carl, Carlos, you're going to, you're going to have to continue Carlos. Cause I, I was, <laughs> I can't, I can't really say anything right now. Sorry. You're gonna have to continue, but wow, that was uh, yeah. So Christian, yeah. you were amazing, Gross. and I see, I see now why Tayo holds you in such high regard. And uh, oh, wow, thank you so much for for joining us here on today's episode of Hustle Culture. Before, thank you. Absolutely. So Before excited. we let you go, we have this uh, we have this segment called Hustlers Pitch. Yeah, think Shark Tank style. You got thirty seconds to. You got thirty seconds oh, yeah. to pitch yourself, someone else out there, your book. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. 
And don't forget, we want to know where <laughs> can people find you and connect with you. So take it away, Christian. Let's hear your hustler's pitch. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find me on my website, shiningscars.com. Um, connect with me on Facebook. Connect with my Facebook page, my Shining Scars page. You will be able to shout out to me, DM me, anything you want. I'll be able to talk to you. I'll be able to switch numbers with you if that's what you want. Introduce you to all the many contacts that you may need. Um, with my book and my nonprofit, you know, it's really great. I really think that it empowers young children and young teens to accept who they are as a person. I also believe that it helps them to see what how others are perfectly imperfect as well. And that today's society, that their stigma, their definition of what beauty and perfection is, that it's just false. It is not true. It is never going to happen for anyone. And that the only way that we are going to be able to remove those stigmas are able to remove those definitions, those billboards, those magazines, um, all the models, the Instagram posts, the Twitter accounts, you know, it's just to be who we are as people and we're human. And we're allowed to be flawed because our body is a canvas. And however we live our life is going to show and let it show with beauty and let it show with kindness. And I think that that's what my nonprofit is all about. It's an anti-bullying program to help those who need to be accepting of themselves and accepting of awesome. others. Yes, absolutely. Great so, job, yeah. Christian. <laughs> You know, we we have a great that, audience that, that, watching us, so we're going to be wrapping up the show here shortly. But if you have time, we'd love for you to stick around for the post show. And if anyone oh. wants to jump in and chat with Christian or Tayo and I, you know, we're going to stick around for a little bit. So our, our last segment is where we do a hustler spotlight. And this is when Tayo and I, we recognize a person in each one of our networks that we think is just doing amazing things. And um, Tayo, I want to turn it over to you. Who is your hustler for the week that you want to spotlight here on Hustle Culture? All right, Go I'm going to cheat this week, and I've got two. <laughs> so um, the first one to repeat is that uh, last week you guys heard me talk about Lewis Howes, uh, who had just released a book. Well, his book became a bestseller this week, a New York Times bestseller. So he was hustling his way, making the book tours. So I, um, I, you know, I just want to give a shout out to Lewis House. And then uh, the second person, um, I, I think you know him very well, Carlos, because his last name is Gil. His first name is Carlos. And, 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 and it's you, sir. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been, um, no, I mean, my man right here got into the two podcast world. You know, he put out his second podcast out on iTunes, Shining uh, Social 545. You guys should leave a review, check it out. And then, um, you know, we had a goal of getting over 20 reviews and, you know, he hustled his way and, um, you know, he carried a load of that. So great job on, on getting this uh, more reviews for this podcast, as well as launching your second podcast and just being you come on to do this. So. Carlos Gill and Lewis Tyler, House. Thank you so much, man. That means a lot. And, uh, you know, I've been I've been really vocal on this as we've been doing hustle culture and moving along. I, I wouldn't be doing this without you. you know, you've definitely inspired and motivated me and also taught me about a lot about the podcasting game. So Social 545, the show that I do with Saba, that is you know really a byproduct of the hustle that we have going on right here with ours. So I appreciate that, my friend. My hustler spotlight of the week is Sean Purry, who is the CEO of Blab. And I saw Sean pop in and out. Uh, so Sean is watching. What's up? Um, but Sean was over in Dublin, Ireland for the Web Summit this week. And Blab debuted a new feature, which a lot of you might be seeing us right now on the homepage. And if you are, welcome to the Hustle Culture Show. Welcome to the Hustle Culture Live. But as Blab debuted this new feature on their homepage, Sean was over in Dublin at the Web Summit interviewing guests. He was live streaming using Blab, actually putting the product to use at an event with a lot of influential people, all while running one of the hottest startups in the social and web game today. So I tip my hat off to Sean. And, uh, you know, again, great guy. Follow him on Twitter. Connect with him here on Blab. He tends to pop you know, in and out of a lot of blabs. So, um, you know, he is my hustler of the week and we hope to get him here on Hustle Culture Live at some point to interview him and talk to him about all the great things that him and his team at Blab are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Sean's a great guy. Sean's a great guy. Well, uh, Los, how, how, do, how do we close this? We're, we're going to do the after show, but before we, we end the recording, um, once again, I want to thank you 
Kristen, for coming on, sharing your story. I think it's made an impact. And it's a testament because we've had, look at that, 396 people have showed up. That is crazy. On a Saturday, college football Saturday. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's, it's a testament to, to you, your story, and and just you being genuine and honest. You know, I, I love the story that you say, you know, age, is, age shouldn't be a barrier. Um, anyone at any age, at any stage in their life will definitely go through times when they think they're not enough. And your powerful message, which which still has me recovering and, and trying to talk in a normal <laughs> way, is is one that that, that, that will go yes, down will. In, in hustle culture history as 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 easily the most uh, the most powerful uh, closing we've had. So thank you for coming on. And uh, you know, Christian, you know, I, I want to echo what, what Tayo said. You know, you've got an amazing story. You are an amazing being with with just an absolute epic soul. Thank you so much for joining us here on Hustle Culture today. And uh, you know, for all of you watching us, thank you as well. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, please leave a review. Let us know what you think of this episode, and we'd love to share your reviews and your feedback with our guest, Christian Leonard. And please make sure that you follow her on Twitter, on social media. Check out her uh, her organization, uh, Shining Scars. And uh, I am sure Christian will be doing more things with you as we progress with hustle culture. So once again, thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. This has been an amazing experience. This is so incredible. I see like little people like raising their hands up and like liking my stuff. And I see all the people over here and all the comments and it's just, it's a whirlwind of feelings. It feels absolutely incredible that you guys are here and that you actually like what I'm saying. Um, thank you guys for giving me this opportunity. Um, I guarantee you that because of you, so many more people are able to be confident within themselves and are more encouraged on a day to day basis. And I know that you both encourage me and I both look up to you all as inspiration to keep on pushing forward and to keep on hustling just because you guys never give up on your dreams and you guys are absolutely incredible and you're more than just business partners and business connections you guys are my friends and i wouldn't want to have it any other way so thank you guys so much all right all right and um before i before i close if you're in raleigh she is speaking at the rise above this month when no, it's not this month it's it's uh, when is it? When is it? It is, but I'm not speaking there that time, so I won't be speaking until like 2016. <laughs> uh, 2016. So look, look out, look out, look out for her in 2016. And um, as once again, as we wrap this episode, like I always say, Los and um, Christian Leonard, use your difference, and that is real talk. Boom. <laughs> Kristen, I, I know a bunch of people want to come on to the show and, and ask you questions. So we really just want to open it up for, for them to talk to you. And Carlos, what do you want to do? Let's open up the seat. If anyone wants to, um, wow, we have more people jumping in. We have 80 live viewers right now. So we have, um, here's what we're going to do, guys. So